Okay, uh, welcome to this week's research exchange. My name is Jeff Wright. I'm the co-director of Citrus, and I'm responsible for the Merced campus. Uh, welcome to uh, th this exchange, and uh, welcome also to our people at the, uh, the remote sites. A couple of uh, messages, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, the i for east seminar, which is going to be on Friday at noon. This, year's top this uh, week's topic is synchrophasers how they are made, making the grid smarter. Uh, another activity that's going to happen next week, you're all probably familiar with the, uh, the Jeopardy episode, which is going to, to pit some of the, the uh, Jeopardy uh, experts against the IBM computer. We're going to have an event in this location where we'll watch that together with moderation by some of the Citrus our Citrus colleagues, um, and we'll have a reception prior to that with some good food. That's going to start at 6.15, so please join us for, uh, for the viewing and the commentary about uh, what's ever going to go on that day. I want to remind you again of the Big Ideas competition, which has been announced. Uh, we encourage students to be aggressively working on their Big Ideas projects. There are flyers in the atrium, and I think there are some flyers in the back table for those of you who aren't aware of big ideas. If, uh, if making money is of interest to you, uh, please enter the big ideas competition. Uh, let me also remind you that next week on Tuesday at 2 p.m. we'll have a lecture entitled Closing the Digital Divide, Broadband Development and Adoption uh, given by Sunny Wright McPeak. Uh, and uh, we're expecting uh, a good audience for that, so come get your seats earlier if you're interested in participating in that discussion and hearing her comments. Uh, one last reminder, uh, we're composting aggressively, so be sure you do a little bit of separation. Uh, your lunch is, is, everything is compostable in the compost bin except aluminum um, if used and plastic bottles, so make sure you separate these out for us. Okay, we're very uh, happy to have as our speaker today um, Mr. Forrest Worthman of Worthman Associates. He is a technical writer and owner of that company. He, uh, was found, he founded uh, the company in 1973 and continues to lead the writing projects as a principal writer and editor. He received an MA in architecture in 1971 and an MA in city planning in 1972 from UC Berkeley. So we're very happy to have him and his colleague with us today uh, with the title Cities and Computers. Please welcome uh, Forrest Worthman. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, as you've just heard, I'm an alumnus of Berkeley from long ago, and it's always a pleasure to visit the campus again. Those of you who understand how computer architecture works have probably learned this through disciplined study. But all of us know a great deal about how cities work, and most of what we know has been learned through intuitive self-discovery rather than disciplined study. I'm going to show in the slides that follow a series of comparisons between city architecture and computer architecture. I hope you find them interesting. If you fly over the 15th century Forbidden City in Beijing, you see a distinctive pattern on the ground. Rectangles connected by lines, which are mostly straight. If you look through a microscope at an early Intel microprocessor, you see a similar pattern. Rectangles connected by lines, mostly straight. If you fly over a modern city, you see the same pattern. The rectangles are blocks of buildings. The lines are the city's road network. If you look at a microprocessor, a modern one on the right, the same pattern exists. The rectangles are blocks of transistors, and the lines are electrical conducting paths. Carver Mead, one of the early pioneers of semiconductors, used an analogy between cities and semiconductors. He said that if the distance between electrical paths 
on a microchip are, is enlarged to the size of a city block. It would look like the road map of the city of Pasadena. Well, there's Pasadena on the left, and there is Carver Mead's 1970 semiconductor layout part of it on the right. He had the form of the, the analogy right, but it doesn't adequately comp uh, compare the relative complexities of each. The semiconductor on the right has only a few functional objects, a few transistors. The uh, comparable city area in Pasadena has hundreds of buildings, each one with min millions of functional objects. Building doors work like transistor gates. Building doors control the flow of objects, people and other things, in and out of the building from the uh, streets and sidewalks outside the building to the hallways and rooms inside the building. Gates in transistors do a similar thing with electrons between source and drain. They control the flow. Here is a schematic of what I just showed you photographically. On the right, a transistor is depicted as a switch gate. If the gate is closed, electrons flow in one direction from source to drain, representing a single signal. If you open a door, any kind of mass or energy can flow simultaneously in two directions. The door I'm illustrating there has a handle on it. If you think about what goes into a simple functional object like a door handle, you discover that it's made of many, many hidden parts. Most of them are moving. Some of them require maintenance. In the case of transistors, here's an illustration of less than a dozen transistors. Although uh, microchips are fabricated in a far more sophisticated technology than our buildings. The functional objects are of far fewer types. There's primarily transistors, resistors, and capacitors. They have no moving parts. They require no maintenance. And the entire microchip can be fabricated in only a few hundred steps. By contrast, large city buildings require millions of fabrication steps uh, object types and moving parts. Zooming out, here is a house with not only a door, but windows. Any one of those that is open will allow the two-way uh, flow of any kind of mass or energy. A microchip, shown on the right, uh, moves only electrons in and out. I've shown them as bidirectional, but in fact, they only move in one direction at a given time. Zooming out further, here is a city residential block on the left and a circuit board on the right. The circuit board has several microchips. They're connected to each other. They, the board itself has cable connectors around the edges to uh, connect with other parts of the computer system. The microchips operate in, together to form a single function, typically. In the case of a city block, the block is connected by this road system on the periphery to other parts of the city, but the individual houses operate independently of one another. Zooming out further, here is a high-rise building still under construction on the left and a rack of computer boards on the right. The high-rise building is a stack of floors. The computer rack is a stack of circuit boards. Both the high-rise building and the computer rack have vertical services that connect them, but the floors of the building can operate either independently or together with other floors, just like the boards in a rack can operate either independently or collectively. Zooming out further, you get a whole image of a set of high-rise buildings. This is downtown Manhattan in New York City. And on the right, a large collection of computer racks in a supercomputer at Los Alamos. The 
Computer racks, as I mentioned, have vertical connectivity for uh, electrical power and signaling and cooling. They also have horizontal connectivity beneath the floor. The city buildings have a similar arrangement, although the vertical connectivity is a much richer collection of types. And the horizontal connectivity at the street level is only what is visible. There's a complex transporta transportation system at the street level, but below that are many services that are hidden. Zooming in on the cabling of a rack, you see a collection of cables. They carry nothing but signals, electrical signals. If you consider the transportation network of a city, you, it accommodates not only the movement of uh, pedestrians and vehicles, but also a huge amount of information that really has little or nothing to do with transportation. It's just there. It's extra stuff. There are um, signs uh, identifying buildings that you can use as visual landmarks for navigation. There are billboards advertising products that you may or may not be interested in. There are display windows enticing you. You can engage passing pedestrians in conversations. You can find out where to find a great pastrami sandwich by asking someone on the street. Networks are key to both cities and computers. The image on the right shows blue metal traces connecting transistors below them. But cities themselves used to be overlaid with electrical networks. The image on the uh, left uh, cor top corner is Manhattan in the 19th century. Electrical wires overhead, lots of them power, telephone, telex. Below that is an image from Pratt, Kansas, around 1900. The downtown is covered with an electrical network. Even today in India, you will find streets covered with electrical wires. Wireless networks exist both at the city level and at the computer level. The, the two have become integrally involved uh, basically, the Wi-Fi and cell phone uh, wireless networks have piggybacked on pre-existing telephone networks that created these early uh, microwave repeater towers and satellites. <laughs> Vertical networking is necessary for both cities and microchips. In cities, uh, vertical networking of transportation of freeways is done with overpasses, bridges, and tunnels. The overpassing uh, allows uh, flows of traffic that are crossing each other to proceed without uh, impeding one another's travel. Vertical networking in buildings is done with elevators and escalators and stairways. In microchips on the right, it's done with uh, vertical channels called vias that connect metal layers. There's a chip with uh, several layers of copper uh, running horizontally and a few vertical vias. Network geometries uh, are shared by cities and computer systems. The there are photographs on the left are diagrammed on the right. The grid mesh is commonly used in dense downtown areas. It is a cyclic graph. It has large numbers of loops. You can go around the same city block over and over again. Next to that is a tree structure. That is an acyclic graph. There's only one possible route from point A to point B. And there are no loops. Below that is a bus. You can see a bus uh, structure in this suburban photograph to, uh, to the left of the diagram. The street running through the neighborhood is the main bus, and the driveways dead ending and the garages are the branches. And occasionally you will find a star uh, and or a ring network. On the left is a, a, an example from Paris. Road networks uh, reached uh, 
almost global proportions in the last 100 years. This is Europe at night. The lights are uh, street lights, building lights, and traffic lights. The image on the right is a conceptual image of internet connectivity. The internet, of course, has reached global proportions in a far shorter time than the world's road networks. Two kinds of switching are used in telecommunications. Uh, circuit switching is used in telephone calls. Uh, the source uh, phones the destination. The telephone company sets up a link that stays fixed for the entire duration of the phone call. The internet uses packet switching. The source creates a message and breaks it into packets, hands it off to a router, and that router sends packets in one of several uh, hops to other routers. At each point, uh, the packets try to find uh, the least congested path to arrive at the destination where the message is reassembled. On the right, you see a diagram of one of the backbone providers for the internet. The points of connectivity are typically large cities, routers, and, and peering points. On the left is uh, an image of the original US interstate highway system from the 1950s. If you travel by automobile from the east coast to the west coast through that highway system, you go city by city, hop by hop, and at each city, you have an opportunity to choose a road out of town that you believe will take you to your ultimate destination. Well, that's pretty much what a packet does on the internet when it goes through a sequence of routers. Here is a, a grid uh, mesh implemented in city streets. The intersections function like internet routers. They give drivers the opportunity to switch their travel direction in order to reach their destination. The roads are, and the intersections are shared by many vehicles moving toward different destinations. On the right, the same kind of grid mesh can be used in microelectronics. The intersections are implemented as crossbar switches. There, there's a diagram of a crossbar switch that implements an intersection. It has four one-way inputs and four one-way outputs. And here's an aerial photograph of a crossbar switch with four one-way inputs and four one-way outputs. I've labeled them in one, out one, in two, out two. And the top diagram on the right is a diagram of that road intersection. Uh, the bottom diagram is a topologically equivalent diagram that is more recognizable to someone working on network switches. Same uh, connectivity different orientation of the ports so that all the input ports are on the left side. Routers include typically both a switching function which moves data from an input port to an output port and a routing function which figures out for a given packet arriving at an input what output port it should go to. This uh, particular intersection has Arrival lanes, uh, I believe you can see them here. This lane here is intended for vehicles that are going to make a U-turn. This lane is intended for vehicles that are going to make a left-hand turn. Whoops. Excuse me. And, uh, and the other two lanes going straight through and so on. I'm losing my direction here. There we go. Uh, this is how a virtual output queue router works. The uh, input ports of such a router have dedicated queues for each output port. So there are four queues at each input port, one for each of the four outputs. That is diagrammed at the top on the right to correspond with this road intersection. And again, I've made a topologically equivalent version on the bottom that looks more familiar to a router designer. Channel storage in city roads is something unique to city roads. It has no equivalent in computer networks. The white dashed lines identify 
parallel parking. There's a huge amount of it on the road systems of cities. There is no equivalent storage on cables connecting input and output ports of a router. This storage of parking, uh, parallel parking is content addressable storage. There are no addresses for the cars. You simply recognize them by their look. Routing in cities is done by a combination of looking at road signs, uh, looking at visual landmarks, and uh, memory, and also road maps. On the right, there is a routing table used by a router. It's created by the router with rather sophisticated uh, software techniques. Uh, it basically is able to map any destination address on the internet to a particular output port on the router. The router looks at the header of arriving packets, which contains a destination address, and assigns an output port to each packet. Elevators in cities work like routers. On the left, at the bottom, step number one, there's a person arriving at an input floor. He looks up his destination, his output floor, on the directory that's posted next to the elevator. And he pushes a button to request transit. He gets in in step two and pushes another button that specifies his output port. Elevator takes him there and he gets out. On the right, a similar kind of function is performed by a router. The packet arrives at the router, at one of the router's input ports. The router itself has constructed the routing table and the router looks at the header of the data packet for its destination address. It determines which output port that packet should go to, places it in the input queue, and eventually it's transported by the switch function of the router to the output port. Fast paths are common in cities. You can see a freeway uh, offering the opportunity to bypass a lot of local road intersections. Uh, even freeways have express lanes. There are also subway trains with express trains underground, and elevators have express elevators. Complex uh, switches, uh, routers on the right, uh, are connected commonly not only to adjacent CPUs, central processing units, and adjacent routers, but some of the uh, arrows particularly the green ones, skip a hop and go to a more distant router to move packets faster. Economical networks are needed in both cities and computer networks. Suburbs have road systems that have far fewer intersections typically than downtown areas. Um, this is useful for reducing the cost of the highway highway system and reducing the traffic noise, but it does uh, result in a reduction in cyclic graph character, fewer choices of w methods to go from point A to point B, and it creates more single points of failure. On the right is a 64 in, 64 out switch. It could be implemented as a 64 by 64 crossbar switch but that would be more expensive than this method called a butterfly network, which uses uh, a large number of much smaller four by four crossbar switches and adds two more stages of switching with cables in between. Again, uh, there's downsides. There is a loss of path diversity. There's only one way to get from a given input to a given output, and there are single points of failure. Addresses are used in packet switching networks for the post office and for the internet. Um, this postal letter has a destination address on the front cover. Post offices use that destination address to figure out which next post office the letter should go to on its way to its ultimate destination. That's pretty much what happens with a data packet on the internet. The header has a destination address, the router's route to the next hop on a path. Other kinds of networks shared by cities and computers are cooling networks. 
In the upper right, there's a, uh, a container that contains circuit boards, uh, possibly a bunch of web servers with a cooling system and a power system. Those containers get trucked right into warehouses that serve as large data centers. Below that is a single board that uh, has a lot of hot chips and requires uh, liquid coolant. In buildings, the cooling systems are much more complicated and much more expensive. Most of the duct work and the machinery on the top is hidden from view. You don't see it, but it's there in the basement, uh, in mid-level floors, and on the roof. Local power is needed by both buildings and cities and microchips. Uh, on the left is uh, typical um, power lines coming in from the grid outside a building. On the right, you can see a pad called power and two pads called ground. All of the transistors in that microchip are connected on one side by, to power and on the other side to ground. There are many networks within buildings that have no comparable computer correspondence. Water for drinking, sewage water, gas networks, hallway networks, elevator networks, escalators, fire sprinklers, and so on. Other networks within cities with no computer counterparts. Service trams, subways, and underground pipelines for fresh water, sewer water, natural gas, and in some cases, steam. Other networks between cities with no computer counterpart. There's an aqueduct from Rome serving multiple cities. There are intercity electricity networks, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, two flavors of rail, passenger and freight, two flavors of ship, passenger and freight, and two flavors of air, passenger and freight. Processing, of course, is key to computers and also to cities. In the upper left is a photograph of a service company. A service company does a very simple thing, a sequence of things. It takes information in from the outside, stores it temporarily, processes it, and sends it back out again. The manufacturing facility bo shown below and the raw materials extraction shown below, these are things that happen at the periphery of cities, but they're generally controlled by some service organization in the center of the city. The circuit board on the right is an entire computer except for power and cooling. It has a microprocessor, disk drive, memory chips, and I.O. devices. It does the same thing, really, as a service company in a, in a city. It takes information in, stores it temporarily, processes it, and sends it out. Cooking does similar kind of activity that a microprocessor would do. The cook brings groceries in on the left, stores them in cupboards, the long-term storage. The inputs to the long-term storage consist of recipes, which are comparable to instructions in a microprocessor, and ingredients, which is comparable to data. When it's time to cook, the cook takes the recipe out, puts it on short-term storage, and takes the ingredients out and puts it on short-term storage. Short-term storage is nearby. It works like a cache. It's very fast to get it, get the uh, access to it during the cooking process. The cooking happens on the cooktop, and when it's finished, output goes to the dinner table. On the right is a simplified diagram of how a microprocessor and a main memory work. Inputs and outputs on the bottom of the main memory. When it's time to do some processing, Data and instructions are taken into short-term memory, cache, and registers, and the central processing unit works on them and sends them back out to main memory and eventually to the output. Pipelines are uh, very common in cities, and they look almost identical to a pipeline of a microprocessor. This is a car wash pipeline. Car number one at the top row is going through five stages of processing. The stages are typically done by someone who's a specialist or has special tools. Uh, you can see in column five, uh, pipeline period five, 
how uh, all five stages are being performed on different cars simultaneously. The washing of a single car takes the same amount of time called the latency, whether or not the process is pipelined. But with pipelining, the number of cars washed per time period, called the throughput, increases in proportion to the number of stages in the pipeline. The image on the right is a, a classic uh, microprocessor pipeline, again with five stages. There are different stages. The first one is uh, instruction fetch. That means copy an instruction from main memory so that the processor can use it. Second stage is decode the instruction, figure out what it's supposed to do and what kind of data it needs to operate on. Third stage is executed, and the last two stages are uh, forms of accessing memory to write or read memory or register. Really complex pipelines, however, are found in places like uh, Boeing production lines. This uh, photograph shows thousands of tasks being done simultaneously, and many of them are stages in a pipeline. Many stations in this photo are serviced by unseen just-in-time inventory delivery systems, and these systems extend the virtual assembly pipeline out into the international community of suppliers. On the right is a diagram of the floating point unit in the IBM cell processor. It's a pretty complicated pipeline in terms of the number of stages but it doesn't compare with the number of stages uh, we would find in an airline production pipeline. Parallel reconfigurable processing is, old, is an old trick in cities. This photograph is from 1923. It's a bookkeeping service company. Uh, each one of the bookkeepers is operating a calculator, possibly doing the same calculation on different sets of data or different calculations on the same set of data. Notice that the uh, carts holding the data files have wheels on them. Everything's reconfigurable. You can shuffle the uh, uh, chairs and desks around as needed for different jobs. People who performed computations like this were once called computers. On the right is a microchip that implements an array of logic and memory, and which can be connected programmatically to perform any number of particular tasks. Storage hierarchies exist in both cities and computers. The city version on the left is uh, quite a simplification. There are a lot more layers than that. Uh, it starts at the top with raw material uh, extraction from production fields, and things proceed downward through the diagram to various warehouses for storage, intermediate storage. There are also refining operations, uh, consolidation operations, and manufacturing operations that happen in between here that I have not illustrated. I've only shown the storage uh, uh, buildings. The uh, speed of access by an end user increases as you move down this hierarchy. At the bottom are personal storage caches. There are briefcases, our lunch pails, the pockets of our clothing. <clears throat> as you go up the hierarchy, the capacity of storage increases. On the right is the computer version. The, the connections tend to be two-way in this case rather than one-way. Um, and the, the box called computer system, uh, which occupies uh, slightly more than half of that diagram, is a small part of one of the homes in the city hierarchy. There is a photograph of a regional distribution warehouse. Lots of square footage covered by roof. Lots more storage in containers out in the parking area. There's a tower with um, microwave uh, antennas uh, 
to communicate with dispatchers and, and truck drivers uh, wherever they may be. On the right is a storage area network implementation. It's a, basically a warehouse for storing data and keeping it backed up. It's accessible over very high speed dedicated lines to uh, computer systems on, in other parts of the country. Automated storage and retrieval is done in cities and computers. The, uh, the example for computers on the right works better than the one for cities on the left, simply because all of the storage devices are of the same size and shape. It's a single module. It's much easier for a machine to recognize and deal with than the case of a city warehouse physical goods where uh, the physical goods come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and they frequently are changed. That's a hard problem to deal with. Storage addresses, uh, buildings uh, had addresses as long ago as first century Rome from Pompeii and Herculaneum. Each city block had a single address. Um, there was a long period in which uh, building addresses were not used. I believe the next occurrence is around 16th century Antwerp. Um, on the right, there are two forms of addressing used in computer systems by operating systems. Memory addressing is very simple. It's just linear numbers. Uh, addressing a disk drive is a much more complicated affair. Storage address tables are used by the postal system and operating systems. And it's quite likely that operating system designers got their idea from the postal systems. In the case of this letter, uh, at the top left, you start with the state. And the state points to a list a, of all states in the country. There's an entry for that particular state, which in turn points to another lookup table that has a list of all the cities in that state. You find your particular city, and that points to the base address of another table that has all the street names for that city and so on, all the way down to uh, the point where you can deliver the letter. Uh, same kind of hierarchy of lookup tables exists for operating system access to main memory. Mobile caches are all over the place. This is, on the left, my briefcase. Within it, I carry other uh, mobile caches, file folders, address books. Uh, on the right, uh, all of the mobile electronic devices that are in common use today, cell phones and laptop computers, have main memory and caches, and they're moving around a lot. This is Hong Kong Harbor. And on the left is an image of a river in Shanghai. You can see the freight boats moving and the ports where they dock and, and unload their goods. They unload their goods and other vehicles come on land, trains, or trucks to pick up and redistribute the goods. On the right is a computer with input-output ports. They are connectors that connect to external disk drives or an Ethernet cable hooked to a router or a camera or other devices. The largest uh, input-output ports in cities in terms of land area are airports. This is the Atlanta airport. It transports physical objects through the air. On the right is a, uh, the closest I could come to a comparable airport for computers. It is a, a tin can antenna pointed at some distant receiver. It's transporting intangible information rather than physical goods through the air. Intermodal I.O. port transfers involve exchange from one type of vehicle to another. They involve delay. <coughs> and um, you can see here a bus arriving. It contains passengers and baggage. Uh, the airport provides space inside for passengers to wait, buffer space, if you will, and space to store baggage until everything can be redistributed to appropriate airplanes. Microprocessor on the right uh, has wires coming off the input-output pads at the top and left. 
the wires on the outside carry signals that have different electrical properties than the circuitry underneath that input-output pad. So there's conversion of electrical characteristics and typically storage and delays. Another example on the left of a ship being unloaded. The cargo is going into these warehouses, the white and red buildings, <coughs> where it will be redistributed to other vehicles. So again, there's uh, storage and delay. On the right is a simple diagram of the relationship between a microprocessor and an I.O. device. There are input and output buffers, first in, first out, FIFO buffers that compensate for the speed differences on either side of the link. Cues are used in computers, implemented either in hardware or in software. Uh, computers have limited uh, capability to reorganize those uh, entries in such a queue. Human queues shown on the left are, are much more flexible. Humans are very adept at dealing with queues. They perform other tasks while they're waiting in the queue. They negotiate with neighbors in the queue to rearrange their positions in the queue. They negotiate to have their place in the queue held while they go off and do other tasks and they do other things. We talked about doors at the beginning, and I want to show you a, how one can diagram the functioning of a door. The diagram at, at right is a Boolean logic diagram. It, has, it consists of two AND gates and one OR gate. OR gate output goes active if either one of its inputs is active, and AND gate output goes active if all of its inputs are active. To open the door from the outside, the top example, you unlock the door and turn the handle and push. That'll open the door. That satisfies an input to the OR gate so the door opens. From the outside, it's the same sequence except you pull the door instead of push the door. So you can diagram the functions of buildings using Boolean logic. This shows flows at building doorways versus flows at transistors. The left side is flows at building doors. Uh, first, flows when the door is open. There are three kinds. And then flows, which are reflections, when the door is closed. Another three kinds of flows for a total of six flows of any number of objects bidirectionally or monodirectionally. On the right, there's only one kind of flow implemented by a transistor. It's a a uh, single signal in one direction. When the gate of a transistor is open, there are no flows. But there is a kind of electronic gate that accommodates six flows, as building doors do. I've repeated the building door image from the prior slide on the left side here. On the right side is, are two diagrams of an exchange gate. The exchange gate works like this. There is a control input that controls how this blue barrier segments the data inputs and outputs. The, the data barrier can flip 90 degrees to reconfigure the connectivity between input and output ports. So in the left version, the flows look very much like an open doorway. There's two directions. In the right figure of the exchange gate, the flows look like reflections happening off of a closed door. So I want to uh, conclude. Uh, very quickly, we talked about functional differences of building doors and transistors. I just mentioned exchange gates. Uh, I forgot to mention, of course, that events in computers occur far faster than in events in cities, which are much, much slower. There are big scale differences. <clears throat> cities are much bigger than computer data centers. Cities contain many computers. Computers do not contain cities. There are more than 20 networks uh, in cities that have no parallel in computers. But the internet 
is, has gone global far faster than any city network, particularly the road network, has gone global. So it will be interesting to see what happens in the future. There's lots of objects and events in cities that have no parallels in computers. What's the uh, parallel, what's the comparable event to a rodeo for a computer or the comparable place of a zoo? Cities are machines, the biggest kind of machine on the planet. They, the classic definition of a machine is it uses power, has many interrelated parts, and performs a task. Well, in the case of a city, the cities perform thousands of tasks, not just one task. People are the special sauce. There are millions of them in cities, and each one has billions of neurons in their brain. And while the city is a machine, it is, of course, also a social and aesthetic experience. And I have not touched on those wonderful aspects of cities in this talk. There's a lot to be said about both of them. Cities are breeding grounds for development of technologies like computers. I think analogies like this are probably most useful uh, for designing complex things, like complex buildings like an international airport or uh, a, a very uh, high throughput manufacturing production line or a very uh, full service hospital. So that is the end of my talk and I will be glad to answer questions and my co-author Martin Morf will help me in that. Thank you very much. Uh, please raise your hands so we can pass you a microphone for your question. Lawrence, uh, you're, I, I think your parallelism broke down there because you weren't looking at robotic machinery as being parallel to the humans, that in fact, uh, if you have something like you say, like a modern factory with lots of robotics and automated machinery, it's very much like a rock concert, that all pieces are interacting with one another. <laughs> I never thought about that. Uh, well, it's a good point. I'll, I'll ruminate on I, that. I, I would just put the robots on the computer side. Other questions? I have one. As I'm looking at your conclusions and, and your uh, summary of your comparisons, um, I was thinking, have you thought about the comparison of cities and computers relative to external attacks, terrorist attacks in cities, uh, spam and so forth attacks to computers? Um, I have not addressed that point specifically. It is a point that applies both to cities and computers. Uh, computers are experiencing lots of attacks. And cities certainly uh, throughout history have uh, experienced so many attacks that cities used to have uh, fortified walls around them. Um, that, of course, stopped being effective when gunpowder arrived um, and battering rams arrived. But um, defense is a major part of uh, technology that goes into countries as well as cities. It's more at the country level, I think, now than the city level. We, we don't have city walls for defense anymore. <laughs> Just to mention Napoleon. Napoleon designed lots of fortifications, both as cities, if you wish, and obviously from a military point of view. Also, I must admit, having been in the service myself, I've, we could write a whole other book on that. And yes, there are all kind of things about making things robust, error correcting, uh, whatever. All these concepts are there. In my mind, the aim of this book was basically to get, get you started. I usually contradicted Forrest on many of his statements, so that's a good way to get started. <laughs> um. Yes? In the comparison of the networks, yes. yeah, I think you shortchanged the computer side. Did I? The networks on the computer side that you typically do not find in cities, um, things like higher dimensional meshes or hyper cubes. Yes. Actually, you're biology has right. them. Biology has them. You're, you're absolutely right. I did not do an adequate job of covering networks. There are a lot of uh, 
very fast serial connections in computer networks or, or even individual uh, microprocessors uh, that should be treated. Um, yes, it's a much richer subject that deserves, deserves more treatment. Yeah. Another issue might be um, exploring the limits of growth. Yes. And, uh, you know, at some point when the uh, surface of the Earth is covered, you know, wall to wall with buildings, that's about it. That's why you have to go to Mars. And so the question is, you know, how many, how many houses can you pack on the Earth? And then uh, a lot more than we have now. I don't no, we think. Can. We, we can. But I'm, I'm wondering how many, say, corresponding data storage elements can you pack in a computer in the ultimate limit? And if you compare the two simply on this numerical scale, what, there might be some interesting stuff falling out. There's a puzzle for you, Martin. <laughs> well, we can all go to the nanoscale and see how nano cities would look exactly. like anyway. Yeah, we can shrink computers down to a nanoscale. We have a problem with shrinking people down. Yes. Well, there are many, many centuries to go before that becomes a problem. Uh, I think the vast majority of the planet is not covered by people. Uh, the oceans, for example. So I, I found it very interesting. I actually was going to mention the networks, too. And I think there is a ratio that is similar to the computers and to the population and city density, because you get a, a certain efficiency ratio based on how things are far apart, and, and you can send data back and forth. And cities serve the same function. So I found you. Your parallelisms are, are just fabulous. I thought this was just a great talk Thank on you. all these aspects and that they relate to each other. It's the way the human mind works and information and people and all these things. It's just really great. And I think there's a scale that both matches to the human existence in cities and to the, co the way computer networks are built. Yes, I agree. It's an interesting topic, scaling. I, uh, at one point, I was trying to construct a diagram that compared scales. And I didn't get very far with it. I got interrupted, but I will come back to that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I wonder if you have looked into the um, thermodynamics of the cities and the computers in the sense that both uh, need uh, energy to process information and work. And they gave away uh, high entropy, if you, if, if, if you can say that. Um, energy in, in the form of wastes and heat. I wonder if, if, if you have looked uh, that phenomenon and, and, co and if you co can compare which one is more efficient. I have not, but it's a very interesting subject. Uh, cities have a big problem with entropy. Uh, we're generating so much waste, it's just appalling. Um, and it's uh, of course, on the computer side, it's become a central focus of microprocessor design now. Uh, how do you scale back the power consumption uh, per instruction cycle? Um, I think uh, computer architects are probably further along than, than city planners are in this subject. I'm pretty sure they are. As you know, in biology, biological systems tend to be much more efficient. Yes, people have started. That's part of the reason, for instance, that people start focusing on using FPGAs for computing, for energy reasons, actually. It's not for speed. Remember, even Intel had to go to multi-core because of the, they couldn't raise the clock rates anymore, and it is simply not efficient. On the other hand, the, the multi basically CPU, GPU core architectures are just very naive in partitioning, so that they will not be the ultimate architectures, and they probably should take a few more biology courses to get better insight. Yes, you can go the other extreme again to uh, basically FPGAs. The CLB is roughly equivalent to a 4004, if you wish. So it's the ultimate uh, multi-core machine. But again, it's an extreme case. And yes, statistics can help you a lot on that. People have redesigned chips into, in the old days in terms of PLAs. One big PLA makes the chip bigger. Suitably, suitably partition in various size, smaller PLAs can make it smaller. You might. Yeah. Another interesting comparison is um, the equivalent of Moore's law. I mean, everyone who talks about computer always mentions equivalent like Moore's law. The question is, you know, what's the Moore's law growth per 
that's a good that's a good one. I'll, I'll try to figure that out. Thank you. Well, more, more, remember that was a management law. They found out early, yes, doubling, uh, I mean, uh, having feature size helps. But then the managers realize a factor of two per 18 months is pretty reasonable. Let's try to stay on that curve. If you look, Intel's curve fits much better than it should, given any statistical model, because it was a management law, ultimately. It started as a geometric law, but ultimately it was a management well, law. I think Yes, but cities have no comparable objective of staying on a Moore's law. On the contrary, you may, may, want, to, may want to slow down. May want to slow down, yeah. There is scalable benefits to cities going to a certain size, and that's all these laws in place about what's the optimum and how many people need. So the parallel is there. Well, yes. we're, we're at a point where we should convene this to a different beverage. Okay. But let's thank our speaker today for a very enlightening talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.